Hello. Testing. We are back. It's been a while, hasn't it? July is over. It is. I'm filming this on August 6th. Um, coming from Korea, where we are in the middle of our monsoon season, I was woken up by lightning and thunder this morning. I'm happy to say there are only three weeks, let's say four, four weeks left of summer. I, for one, <laughs> am happy about that. That being said, it's time for a monthly wrap up. I didn't count how many books I read, but it's kind of a cheat month because I went to Seattle. If you're interested in seeing my first experience in the Pacific Northwest, I have a vlog on my other channel, Carrie Cakes, that will be linked down below. But that means that I was on an airplane for a total of 20 something hours. So I read more books than usual. So we're going to go through them all. And one of them, hint, I got last month thanks to the sponsor of this video. So thank you so much to Book of the Month. I'm going to pass you over to future me who has received my package. Yes, hello, I'm here with my Book of the Month. So Book of the Month, as you know, is a subscription service where every single month they comb through all of the new releases and they pick the best across all genres and offer it to their subscribers at one low controlled price. They will all be hardcover. They will all be the same price. You can pick two or more. You can get add-ons. You can easily cancel or pause your subscription. They have podcasts. They're wonderful. Book of the Month, such a huge fan. What did I choose for August? I had the most horrible time <laughs> because there were so many amazing books this month. One of them which I did not get is A Sorceress Comes to Call by T. Kingfisher. That is an option for an add-on. I review it later in this video. Um, I wanted a physical. I want a physical so badly, but I can only pick two. So here I am. Um, I should have just gotten an add-on. I'm kicking myself. Anyway, uh, what did I get? I got Hera. Jennifer Saint is like the queen of retelling Greek mythology, and this follows Hera. We're gonna kick some Zeus butt, I think. Very excited about this, but what I'm most excited about within this box, the seventh veil of Salome or Salome. Google tells me two different things. I think it's Salome, but anyway. Um, this is by Silvia Moreno-Garcia of Mexican Gothic. So excited, especially because at the library I had a 17 week wait. This, I don't even know what it's about actually. It's the 1950s in Hollywood. Every actress wants to play Salome, the star making role in a big budget movie about the legendary woman whose story has inspired artists since ancient times. Before the curtain comes down, there will be tears and tragedy aplenty in this sexy Technicolor saga. Oh, super excited. I'm willing to read anything she writes, so I honestly didn't even look. Thank you to Book of the Month. If you are interested in trying Book of the Month, you can use the code FIREFLY to get your first book for $9.99. Definitely check them out. They have brought me this month. One of my favorite reads of the month was a Book of the Month pick for July. They truly have some great picks, again, across all genres. So highly recommend. Thank you as always to Book of the Month for sponsoring this and for giving me some great books. I will pass you back to the July wrap-up version of me. Bye! Let's dive in, shall we? Once again, the books in the beginning of the month. <laughs> Thank God for my notes, that's all I've got to say. Um, I left you off last month with I was close to the middle of Lucy Undying. This is an arc, this is coming out, if it hasn't already come out, it's coming out soon. This was an arc that I was reading, I got it through NetGalley. The cover had me, the concept had me. The first 30% of the book had me. And then, so sad, it kind of lost me. Lucy Undying is a story about Lucy who is one of Dracula's wives. We follow her through three different timelines and this is kind of the problem that I had. We have present day London, we have Lucy pre transition into vampire as she is just this kind of naive but not really naive young girl. And then we have her at this other weird point in her life where she's in therapy. <laughs> the issue I had with this is that the, in my opinion, the present day storyline was so juicy, so good, that it made the other two POVs or timelines 
not as fun to read and I think that especially with Lucy's kind of journals prior to her meeting Dracula it just got kind of old and then once we have there's a point in which in present day the journals are brought up and then we like revisit the journals through present day as well it was just her backstory wasn't quite interesting enough for the amount of pages it was given i really just wanted to know more about present day so overall just really got bored with it i i didn't finish it i actually left it i think it's sitting at an 80 percent which is wild because if I'm gonna read 80% of a book, I'm gonna finish it. Like usually I only DNF books when it's like 50%, sometimes even 60%, but once I hit like 70, 80%, you might as well finish the book. But I honestly wasn't compelled and that's a super bummer. I would still recommend giving it a try because again, like the there were parts of it that were so good, especially the first 30%, I was into it. Um, it just was lacking something for me. It took me so long to read it. That was Lucy and I. After that, I have a physical because when it's hot, I go to the bookstore when I shouldn't. The Old Woman with the Knife. This is translated. This is a dark comedy about a serial killer that's like an elderly woman and because she's getting older she starts to make mistakes in the business and you don't make mistakes when you're a serial uh not a serial killer when you're like a hitman excuse me we of course start to hear about her past and maybe her past is finally catching up with her um it was fine i think it was actually the first chapter if i remember correctly yes okay the very first chapter she describes what it's like to be on the subway on a friday night in seoul and she got it like oh my god it was so it was only like what seven pages i was there i she captured a seoul subway ride experience so perfectly like these minute details that I was like, yes, I I am committed. I'm going to read this book. I will say, I think I like got the gist probably two thirds of the way through. It kind of gave me the entertainment that I wanted it to give. I didn't feel drawn to actually finishing it. I did finish it, but it was sort of like, I didn't super care about the plot. I just kind of cared about the way that she wrote her dark comedy. So I wouldn't say it's like an outstanding story but I thought that the writing was quite fun especially just the way that she describes Seoul or certain parts of Korean culture when it comes to hierarchy things being a woman that's getting older so there were a, there was a lot in here that I liked but as an actual plot wasn't my absolute fave but if you're looking for some translated Korean literature the old woman with the knife Ooh, next up I read a very interesting, I believe newly released work called Rainbow Black. This was about the satanic panic, which is something that I am quite interested in. Crazy but interesting time. So I was excited to read this. We follow a girl whose parents are accused um, of satanic panic-esque crimes and what happens to the entire family as that goes down. I will say it was too long. I was very much on board for probably 75% and then I was just like, when is this ending? <laughs> if you're interested in the satanic panic, I think that the, like I said, the first 70% excellent, but it was drawn out a little. There were like too many characters that we kind of followed their story to the end and I didn't think we needed to follow everyone's story to the end. I get why we did, but I don't think it needed to be as long as it was. So that's Rainbow Black. Still give it a try. Go in with caution, but let me know your thoughts. I know a lot of you guys have read it. What did you think? Am I alone in thinking it was just a little, little too long? Hmm. Okay, next up is a book that I have talked about quite a bit already on this channel, on my TikTok, on my Instagram. Here we go. Forest of Dreams and Whispers. Yes, do I keep calling it Forest of Dreams and Whispering? I do. This was a grand old time. This is a kind of gender swap retelling of Sleeping Beauty with our main characters having a similar dynamic to simultaneously Cardin and Jude, but also Emily and Wendell from Emily's uh, like Map of the Otherland, which I know that Cardin and Wendell we are not necessarily comparable, but they are kind of goofy 
himbo fay <laughs> could just go with me here um this was a this was a fun a fun time it can be read as a standalone in my opinion um it doesn't have like any kind of cl cliffhanger ending but it does continue i am planning on continuing the series but yeah this was just really if you are i believe it's on kindle unlimited like i think i just needed a good fun fantasy it had that kind of comfort of being somewhat nostalgic in terms of again like it just felt like a callback to Harden and Jude or Emily and Wendell but it still felt very new and I appreciated the dynamic I appreciated the curse and the magic yeah I just I had a really good time somebody when I talked about it someone commented like very unexpected smut at the end and i will warn you that yes it does randomly we go from like zero to a hundred um in terms of smut but i think it was like handleable it was okay for me like i was able to handle it i think that we could have taken one of those scenes out um but yeah so if you if anybody is like is there a spice there is um but it definitely wasn't the main focus of the book at all it was very very yearning very he is obviously a simp for her and she is just like girl i really did enjoy it i'm honestly putting off reading the second one only because i'm kind of keeping it in my back pocket for when i need a good fantasy to read um so that's only a compliment to the author so yes forest of dreams and whispers have fun after that i feel like I, I have a very interesting mix of books um i tried to mood read as usual but i also just have so many books that i need to finish that i i pushed myself to read some books so if if this feels like a chaotic month it is uh after that i read all fours by miranda july thank you to nathan for lending me his arc of it um if you don't know i really like miranda july when i was in college that was really my like lit fic short story era so i really latched onto her no one belongs here more than you um collection or her film things like that she has been mia ish um, in terms of writing for about 10 years so this was very exciting to see her newest release and it was just as bonkers and strange as Miranda always has been the craziest thing is that I read probably I read probably like a hundred pages of this and quite a bit of time passed and then I tried picking it back up again and when I tell you I didn't remember a damn thing that happened in the first bit jumping in especially into a miranda july story i was like why is she decorating a hotel room like if you don't know miranda july is a bit absurd it's also like very strangely sexual but it's all about desire and like all of her characters like her, specifically her main characters have a very rich inner world where they almost are completely separate from the world around them and so we follow her main character who is a mother who is going on a cross-country trip to go meet her friends in new york and she just like stops at a motel 30 minutes away from home and stays there the whole trip ends up in this affair with the guy who works at the gas station it's all very bizarre but it's all just kind of about like i said desire and having an inner world and what do you really want can you want so many things at once and what happens when you do and um just i fully enjoyed it thank you so much again to nathan and um yeah but it is it is super anything miranda touches is going to be a little odd <laughs> so full warning but um all fours next up your girl's got a lot of physical books i just really loved the cover of this one okay first of all chosen ones veronica roth I did not read Divergent. However, um, I did read When Among Crows, and I really enjoyed this. This was my first Veronica Roth. I highly recommend this one, a little urban fantasy based on like Polish fairy tale. It was just, ooh, ooh, this was, one was really good. I reviewed it, and her team was nice enough to send me more of her books. They were like, we heard you haven't read Veronica Roth. We would like you to read Veronica Roth. So here I am. And yeah, I read The Chosen Ones. This one was a little weird. This is, I believe, adult. And it honestly gave me, not as funny, but it almost gave me a kind of Umbrella Academy feeling 
Um, we follow these superheroes after they have saved the world. It's been 10 years since this very strange magical person appeared and started creating these voids that would just swallow up millions of people. Like it was truly catastrophic what was happening in the world and then they managed to kill him and la da happy days, everything is back to normal. Um, except obviously they are dealing with a lot of trauma. And by the way, rule number one of killing someone, uh, did you see the dead body? Did you take its pulse? Did we burn it, behead it, do all the things we needed to do? All right, I liked it, but I was also confused by it. It takes a turn um, that I didn't see coming and I was, it was very strange. So I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. There were times when I wanted to put it down and I was kind of like, mm, maybe this just isn't for me. But then I found myself being like, well, no, I need to know. I need to know what happens. Give it a try, it, like get it at the library maybe. If it sounds interesting to you, like these kind of beaten down, traumatized chosen ones who have saved the world and just wanna get on with their lives, but they have to come save the world one more time. If that sounds up your alley, give it a go because I'm really on the fence about this. Like I keep thinking about it. So I feel like that's a good sign. This is also something that I've learned. I didn't know this about Veronica Roth. All of her books take place in Chicago. And this is very much like a love letter to Chicago. I think if you have a mental map of that city in your head, it will make this even more interesting. Is, are there maps? Yeah, like there are maps. Um, I bet it would be an even more fun experience if you have that uh, mental map in your brain. But yeah. Chosen Ones, Veronica Roth, I kind of struggled to finish, but I also couldn't stop thinking about. So, also a fun cover. I just like the glitter. Anyway, there you go, Chosen Ones. Next up is a book that I got uh, from the library and I think I saw someone else reading it and that's how I found out about it, but it is Blue Ruin. This was so odd. I had no idea what it was going to be about going into it and it's kind of a COVID book. We follow a man who is an artist who originally was living in London and so we kind of have these flashbacks to his life as an artist in London and his life now where he's living in New York. He's like a grocery delivery guy. He's delivering groceries to someone, I think it's on Long Island or something like that, outside of the city. He realizes it was his girlfriend, longtime girlfriend, like one of those life-changing relationships from when he was an artist in London. It's during COVID. He's sick. He may or may not have COVID. So she is like, listen, we live in this giant compound. Why don't you go stay like in this room above the garage kind of thing? Don't let anyone know you're here. Here. So he's like hiding out in this very weird, it, it had this just icky feeling to it. You felt very unsafe. And as he's kind of like having these delusions and just like every day his ex-girlfriend is bringing him food in the garage, we're also getting these flashbacks to his time in London. So I said, I feel like maybe I didn't get the message or his whole life is a fugue state. Yeah, I wasn't exactly sure what I was meant to be getting out of this, but it was just intriguing the whole time because you were waiting for something to happen. I think that's one that I want to return to and reread. I definitely underlined a lot of things, but I think maybe it was partially my mind at the time, but I wasn't quite sure what I was meant to walk away from with it, but it was just so visually strong. Like I have such a strong image in my mind of that house and the grounds and everything like that, but it is a COVID book, so be aware. Um, it was very strange to read about all of that. The, can you put your mask on please? Like all that stuff was very like, ugh, I, ugh, too soon. Um, but yeah, that is Blue Ruin. <laughs> After that, I got on the airplane. So as you know, romantic comedies and I on an airplane can't be beat. So I went with One Night Only. This is the first book by Katherine Walsh. I love Katherine so much. I follow her on Instagram. I think she's just the funniest person. <laughs> and her specifically, I think I've only read her like Christmas ones. I think it's called Holiday Romance and Snowed In. So good. Please read those. If you want like a Christmas in July kind of feeling, please. One Night Only was her first ever published work and it had the seeds. Like I can see Catherine's greatness in it, 
but it just wasn't a fully she wasn't fully realized I don't think in this um we follow uh where do I begin our main character has a one night stand that went extremely well but she's like nope one night only babe get out of my house and directly after that she has to fly to Ireland because her best friend is getting married and who is the best man who is the brother of the groom that her best friend is getting married to oh yeah the one night stand and she is the maid of honor so of course she has to be around like this is not just like a one day thing she is there for like the whole week schmoozing with the family all this stuff and then we follow them back to new york city um and it's just it was good like there were definitely like i said these the banter is always really good just the like hilarious situations that they get themselves into is really good my only issue with this one is that i don't love a story when our main character's issue is just vaguely trust <laughs> issues and it comes up at the most inopportune time it's just like an easy fallback of like everything's going great and then the girl is like wait no i had a bad experience with a man once let's break everything off even though like it's even though everything's perfect like it it just feels a little like that excuse feels a little thin and that was the only thing keeping them apart pretty much was just our main girl suddenly being like ah commitment so it was just kind of a frustrating read it was okay but i don't think this was anywhere near the level that she is at now and i can't wait to read she has another she has one more that i haven't read and she has one coming out that she's working on i can't wait for those so i would say you could pass on one night only i feel like i just hold her at such a high level because of what i've already read her worst is not bad <laughs> so that's one night only if you like brooding irishmen who own a pub and secretly pine and host pancake breakfasts for the community <laughs> um how about it <laughs> how about it one night only super quick this was recommended by a couple of you guys um as like a good airplane book and uh, this is alex approximately i feel like if i had read this when i was 13 yeah i would get it um, but as of right now, it was just kind of too young adult for me. Like, Netflix would get their paws on this and make, like, a Kissing Booth-esque level story. Alex approximately is about a girl who is moving in with her father. Um, I believe she's from New Jersey. She's moving with her father, um, who lives in California. Something, something, mom, divorce, new husband, something, whatever. Anyway, she moves to California, gets a summer job where she's working at this old, like, museum place but her real goal over summer is to finally meet her digital pen pal they met on like a film enthusiast chat board chat room or something like that and she doesn't want to be disappointed like what if meeting face to face ruins their friendship so she has not told him that she has moved to his town like what a strange coincidence that her dad lives in the same town as him but so she's spending the summer like trying to find all the film enthusiasts her age and like figure out which one of them is her best friend slash soulmate like i said i think if i had read this when i was much younger i would have liked it a bit more but overall for me it just wasn't it just wasn't the one but it did have very good summer vibes so if you are more into like if a b-list netflix movie vibe is what you need and you want a great summer vibe as well alex approximately will do the trick for you i would say it wasn't bad it just wasn't my speed i would say alex approximately and then i was in seattle a place that has a dangerous amount of bookstores for me to visit and i tried to keep them small because i was just traveling with a carry-on so a lot of these were easy to finish quite quickly and the one that i bought and finished on the same day is we are all equally far from love this is by the same author as minor detail which which is also on my list to read both of these books take place in palestine this one follows a large cast of characters and they are all dealing with some kind of heartbreaking love honestly this book was just really sad i ended up feeling very melancholy for the rest of the day we start off with a woman who is writing letters to this man that she slowly falls in love with and then that flows into the girl who now is in charge of running the small town's post office 
who stumbles upon these letters then that leads into this and it's so all of them are connected but we never quite go back and see their ending we just kind of it is assumed sometimes confirmed but mostly assumed that everyone has just a rough time a really rough time um so this is one that will definitely be reread i think reading it in one go i couldn't have done it any other way but i think if i were to reread it i would read it more slowly to kind of let everything sink in but yeah this was beautiful but immensely sad um, and I can't wait to read minor detail now having read this. So that is, we are all equally far from love. Read it at a time where you can handle it, I think. Just a bunch of sad, a bunch of sad. After that, I haven't technically finished it yet. I'm only halfway through, but I got The City of Mist. This is by the author of Shadow of the Wind, which I have read, which I have reviewed. I didn't continue the series, just I haven't had time. Um, but when I saw this tiny little guy, I was like, yes, I have room in my suitcase for you. You're coming home with me. This is a collection of stories that he wrote when he knew that he was entering the last stages of his life. He passed away from cancer in 2020. And these came out just sort of as like a thank you to his fans. Um, to his readers and so a lot of it touches on the world of Shadow of the Wind. It has just like that general feeling that he writes. A lot of it surrounds death obviously but it's also about a storyteller. Like I kind of thought that all of these stories were unique and separated but then you start to be like well who's telling this story and is this a story about this boy or is it is there some other greater story to I can't describe it but basically where I am in the book I'm interested in where this is gonna go but yeah all of these stories are just very much like truly captures the feeling of shadow of the wind and i highly recommend it if you love his work so that is the city of mist can't really say much because i don't really know what's happening i have to be on the ride a little bit longer to tell you but that is something that i have been chipping away at throughout the month after that back on my airplane i finished a sorceress comes to call i got the arc of t kingfisher's newest work it comes out this month it is a pick for book of the month this month if you would like a hardcover copy of it my code is down below okay a sorceress comes to call this is a retelling of the goose girl i believe it is called we follow a girl who's raised by her single mother who is incredibly controlling there are no secrets in this house we do not shut the doors of this house you do not have friends except for your horse. <laughs> She's living in just this truly abusive situation. And when her mom's benefactor leaves the picture, let's say, she needs to find someone else to pay for her lifestyle. And so they go traveling to find a person who kind of fits what she needs. And we find this old bachelor and his kind of spinster sister. And when they move in, we suddenly enter this almost like Agatha Christie-esque dinner party. The sister is very suspicious of the mother. So she invites all of her friends to come and like suss out what's going on. And so yeah, it's almost as if like that kind of, and then there were none feeling plus a fairy tale combined. I did like it. I was kind of hoping for the laugh out loud comedy that you see in her kind of like paladin's grace fantasies but this was more of like a nettle and bone where it was very dry dark humor but also absurd and funny so there were plenty of laughs but it was just a different kind of funny um i just love any voice that t kingfisher writes in i love it and so i had a good time um sorceress comes to call anything that she is serving i will eat it up and then my last airplane book I read We Could Be So Good. I talked about how much I loved, I, I got an arc of it. I believe it's out now. It's definitely out now. I saw it in the bookstore. You Should Be So Lucky is technically the second part of We Could Be So Good. So certain characters from You Should Be So Lucky are from We Could Be So Good. Again, kind of like T. Kingfisher, anything Cat Sebastian writes, I just love. What Cat Sebastian kind of specializes in is historical queer romances. So what's so wonderful about her books is not only are they funny as hell, they will make you cry, the characters are just 
so good but you also get a very interesting kind of history lesson like we didn't have a lot of these like mainstream queer romances set in like the 50s the 60s etc this was a time when even straight couples on tv slept in separate beds you know so getting these stories told just feels really special and she just writes so well so we could be so good follows two journalists it's sort of like a golden retriever black cat energy they are not it's not enemies to lovers but it's like the black cat really fucking hates the golden retriever but he hates that he can't hate the golden retriever you know it was just really sweet and heartbreaking but just I will also say that this one felt like it had the most plot. I'm kind of okay with her writing without any kind of destination in sight, but We Could Be So Good and also You Should Be So Lucky, I think had much more of, of a plot. So if that bothered you about if you've ever read Cat Sebastian, especially We Could Be So Good, I felt like it truly had a fully developed plot that we saw an end to. <laughs> um, just love. Nothing but love. And now, for my book of the month book, from last month, The God of the Woods. I've seen this everywhere. Everyone's talking about this. The cover's fun. And it's about a summer camp. Somebody goes missing at a summer camp in the woods, in the Adir Adirondacks in the 70s. So I thought, perfect summer read. And I was right. This was great. I've seen some people saying like, this is the best book they've ever read. I wouldn't go that far. But if you're looking for a thriller that takes place during summer, has a bit of a tinge of history to it, just like a rich family with secrets, this does the job. We have a bunch of different POVs. We have like a camp counselor. We have the best friend of the girl who goes missing. We have some family members, etc. But we're basically trying to figure out where on earth <laughs> did Barbara go? Uh, Barbara, the camper who happens to be the daughter and heir to the fortune and legacy the family that owns the camp so like the one camper you definitely shouldn't lose is gone i really enjoyed it i think there were a couple things that were mentioned that were like supposed to kind of throw you off the scent of like who done it it didn't bother me while i was reading it but once i finished it and i kind of was thinking back it did kind of bother me because i was like why was that even added other than to just kind of throw us off the scent so it's definitely twisty i definitely didn't know what was going on until the very end and yeah i just thought overall it delivered exactly what i wanted it to deliver um it was a little long but i think that the breaking up of the povs and the timelines and things like that helped me eat it up and i think i read this in like two days or something like that the god of the woods i do recommend i took a break to try and get my voice back mm, still no so we're gonna we're gonna finish this up i really tried to focus on getting my net galley percentage back up very thankful to have been given a lot of arcs but how NetGalley works, so an ARC is an advanced reader copy. So publishers will send out advanced copies of books before they've been published so that they can get feedback and reviews and things like that. And NetGalley is a place where you can do that. But on NetGalley, you have a percentage where it's like, we gave this girl 10 books and she's only reviewed one. So you want to have a higher percentage so that publishers will trust you. So I was working pretty hard this month to kind of get that situation fixed. So these next two are arcs. First one being This Fatal Kiss. First of all, the cover had me gorgeous. This was an odd little book. We are following our main character who is a water nymph and you become a water nymph when you are a woman who has been killed around water some like tragic death near water and she has heard a rumor that if she can get a human to kiss her she can get her mortality back and she is like freshly dead <laughs> so she's like time's ticking i gotta go before my family misses me you know gotta get my humanity back so she ends up teaming up with the town exorcist whose entire life revolves around getting fantastical creatures such as water nymphs out of his town. But when she discovers a secret of his, she kind of blackmails him into being her wingman to help her woo this guy that she's like, he's gonna, he's gonna kiss me. So I think maybe for me, it was like expectations were a little bit off. The kind of concept and especially the descriptions of 
the town felt very of another time. Very much like a little fairy tale village, but the way that the characters spoke was very modern and almost Gen Z-esque. Like someone said something and she was like, and wasn't that a whole mood? And I was like, when are we? Like what's going on? But I did actually like the story. I will say that the twist, I saw it from like page 20 or what, like within the first chapter basically. So I spent the book kind of feeling like our main characters were really dumb. I think there's a line between dramatic irony and just making the characters look bad because I could not believe that they were so blind to this. I also wish that the romance was a little bit more obvious. I could not for the life of me tell what the girl was thinking the entire time. So when we realized that they have feelings for each other, it sort of felt like I know that based on the setup of the story, like this enemies to lovers trope, I know they're supposed to have feelings for each other, but like, when did that happen? It's just all of a sudden, it's like, oh my god, yeah, I always thought you were the one. You know, it, it just kind of came out of nowhere. So I think this book has a lot of potential. There also will be a sequel. So I think that the second book has a lot of potential to be great because the author clearly has great ideas. I just think it wasn't fully executed in this debut, but I am hoping that with feedback and stuff like that, from the first one. The second book will be even stronger. I would still give it a go if you're interested in a kind of modern feeling fairy tale. Almost all of the characters are queer. I thought the descriptions were really beautiful. This kind of hot springs town in the mountains. So there was a lot there, but it just wasn't, it was missing something for me, I think. Um, that is this fatal kiss that cover though. Next up, another arc that I believe just came out actually, that is Don't Let the Forest In, calling all Raven Cycle Adam and Ronan fans. Are you here? <laughs> I feel like you would really love this book. This takes place at a boarding school in the mountains of Virginia. We're following our main character who is dealing with a lot. He has a lot of anxiety. He's struggling with his sexuality. He's just having a rough go of it. This is his senior year. He's not having a good time. Um, and he really only interacts with his roommate slash best friend slash big ol' crush, who is this kind of agent of chaos. He's a boy that gets in a lot of fights. He's an artist. He doesn't necessarily do well in school, but he is an artistic genius. And he also hangs out with his twin sister, okay? Those are the only people he interacts with. Coming into school this year after summer, he's a little stressed because the last day of school at the beginning of summer, he gave his friend something that was basically an open love confession and he's kind of freaking out because he hasn't heard anything back. As the school year continues and the forest surrounding the school that's always been off limits starts to encroach upon the campus in a mysterious way, we just have to follow this story. And I just thought the way that anxiety and grief and shame and so many of these emotions were, were written about, it was just really excellent. I think very specifically for the Ronin and Adam fans. You just want to like take the characters out of the story. I just wanted to like go drive to their school and pick them up <laughs> and be like, boys, we're going somewhere better. I will say the ending was a little strange, but if you read the acknowledgments, the author specifically is like, I want you to walk away unsure of that ending. <laughs> so I was like, well, you got me, worked on me. Highly recommend it. Also delves into like asexuality and that is not often talked about in like young adult work because there's such a focus on romance and like physical romance. So that was very refreshing as well. But yeah, just overall, I do recommend don't let the forest in. Next up, even though I was not on an airplane, I sat down and I read a romantic comedy because people wouldn't stop talking about it. And that is not another love song, not a love song, not another love song. We are following two musicians. They are both in the same orchestra and one is a cellist and one is a violinist. And of course the moody man has never noticed our quiet violinist before until they have a run-in at a wedding where she has been hired to play. And after that run-in, all hell breaks loose. I will say that if you are a fan of romance books, this will do it for you. I think for me, you know, 
you know that I love the yearning and this they didn't yearn too much this was pretty much like they made eye contact and they were like yeah <laughs> this is happening so there was a little bit there was definitely like this man is such a simp which I love the smut actually made me kind of laugh it was kind of so absurd that it had me giggling <laughs> um specifically one scene there's a lot of like they're naked playing their instruments and something about that just makes me laugh anyway so i think it's fine i think if you like a very smutty like immediately smutty book um go for it i thought the the writing was great like the characters were great i enjoyed them but just in terms of like my personal style i prefer a yearn but it was funny. It took place in New York for the most part. I loved the descriptions of the music and when they're like playing together, I thought that that was really wonderfully done. So my only complaint is that it just wasn't, it wasn't my type of romance, but really give it a go. My last physical book. I finally gave Sally Rooney another chance. I read Conversations with Friends a few years ago, was not the biggest fan. This felt very hmm, different in many ways, similar in many ways. I'll get the negatives out of the way first. Sally Rooney, I just never like her characters. I never like them. They seem like horrible people. <laughs> I haven't read normal people, but I just don't like how they talk to each other, how they talk to themselves, what they do in their lives. The romantic relationships never make sense to me. Yeah, I just, these are not people I would ever want to hang out with. So that's my negative, is just, I, I hate these people. <laughs> that being said, uh, this was beautifully written. This was quite interesting because we follow mainly two girls, Eileen and Alice, who are friends. Um, they are living in different parts of the country, and so we get not only their daily lives, but then we also, every other chapter, we get emails that they send to each other. And it's very funny how their in real life conversations are just so unexciting, I suppose. They're just sort of like, what do you like to do? What's your ideal first date? Like those kind of questions. But then when they're emailing back and forth with each other, they touch on such deep topics. So it was just very funny and I actually really liked that juxtaposition. I wouldn't say that this was going to be on my list of like my top 10 books of the year, but I did really enjoy it. I underlined so much and I talked about this on my TikTok, but there's one scene in particular just on like a purely writing level. Two characters, Eileen and Simon, are in one of their apartments and they're having a conversation in the living room and then they go off to the bedroom and continue their conversation but we as the reader are not taken to the bedroom. We stay in the living room. And so all of a sudden, like we're reading and it's like, Eileen says this and Simon says this and then Simon walks down the hall. And then all of a sudden she starts describing how quiet the living room is now. The sink is dripping and you can hear Eileen murmuring from the other room. And it was just, I got chills. It was so like, as a reading experience, oof, I said this in my other video, but it like took me out of the story, but also put me in it. And as I was reading it, I was literally like, I am intruding. Like I am, why am I a stranger standing in their living room? Like who gave me the right to see so deeply into these people's lives? So just her, she does certain things with her writing that I really appreciate, even if I don't as a whole, ever truly love her stories, I will admit that as a writer, she's got something going on for sure. That is Sally Rooney, Beautiful World, Where Are You? Okay, my last two. This one was also an arc. This one was an, a highly anticipated arc and this one was a DNF and that is, this will be fun. It was described as being similar to A Princess Bride, and people we meet on vacation, <laughs> which I was like, I don't know about that, but anything that has to do with The Princess Bride, count me in. Similar actually to The Chosen Ones, we're actually following these heroes that have saved their kingdom and we're following them many years after the fact. I think it's maybe seven or it might be 10 years after the fact. All of these heroes have gone their separate ways. They are not in contact with each other. They don't like each other. 
one of the heroes, the leader of the crew, has died. And they're all dealing with that trauma in different ways. Unfortunately for this book, the prologue in which we see, in which we like meet them while they're young, was really good. And then now that we're in the present, it didn't have the same energy. And I think that when a book has a time jump and then like they keep referring to this event, why aren't they friends anymore? What was this event? I think that's like a risky move. And this book kind of fumbled it because they kept referring to this fight or like, what did, what was her name? Beatrice, this thing that Beatrice did we can never forgive Beatrice. And they just kept talking about it, but they gave us no clues. I ended up putting it down at about 40 to 50%. They were giving us nothing. Like normally you could give us maybe like a little bit more to think like, did she kill someone? Did she say something? Like we have no reference. It just kept being brought up of like, Beatrice did this. So it just got kind of old. It was like the boy who cried wolf. I was just like, just tell us what Beatrice did at this point. And then once we find out what Beatrice did, it was told to us, first of all, told to us, not shown, directly told to us from Beatrice's mouth in the most anticlimactic way possible. So then once I read that, I was like, well, why was that such a, you know, like it wasn't, you built this up and then you were just like, yeah, Beatrice did this. Uh, mm. It just wasn't, it wasn't fabulous. And I wanted to love it so much because specifically this one character reminded me so much, like if you tried really hard and if you had the narrator's voice in your head from My Lady Jane, it could have been the My Lady Jane kind of humor, just this one POV unfortunately. Um, and the rest of them just didn't, didn't do it. It also had the thing of like, a fantasy world that tries to incorporate modern things. So one of our girls is obsessed with shadow plays, which is really like soap operas, but there's some like magic that she can watch these shadow plays in her head and then she can access, she uses her magical tapestry, which is just like the internet to like talk to people. It was really like, mm, I could see the ideas, but it just wasn't it didn't work out for me, unfortunately. So I did put it down. I was gonna keep pushing through, but I was just like so uninterested. So please let me know because then I looked on NetGalley and I saw a lot of people give it five stars. So I don't know if maybe I just missed something. There were quite a few other people who fully agreed with me, but a lot of people liked it. So once it comes out, give it a try and let me know your thoughts. This will be fun. Where was the Princess Bride? <laughs> Is what I want to know. <laughs> and then after that, last but not least, technically I finished this in August, but I want to talk about it now because I can't wait another month to talk about it. I read Air by Sabah to hear. Oh, yes. Okay, this is a new series. This author wrote the Ember in the Ashes series, <clears throat> which I loved. It was one of the first, I think I read Six of Crows, a Court of Thorns and Roses, and then Ember in the Ashes in terms of like me getting back into my fantasy world, you know, getting back into reading in general. Um, so Ember in the Ashes has just like a huge part of my heart. I have reread the series. I think I've read the series maybe three times, which is abnormal for me. I'm not usually a rereader, especially not a series. So that's saying a lot. So when I saw that she was coming out with another series, jumped on that. Um, I did know that Air would be taking place in the same world as Ember in the Ashes, but I was not aware that it was going to really heavily rely on the story that unfolded in Ember in the Ashes. So I would say you need to read that series before you can read Air. All of the characters from Ember in the Ashes are not main characters, but like essential characters in air and understanding their dynamics and also understanding the world at large she kind of skips a lot of world building in air in order to dive right into the action which i loved but i think if you have never read her previous series you'd be a little lost so that's just my disclaimer but air was so good it was so it was so good we follow quite a few different POVs. I don't want to go too far into it because I don't want to spoil anything, but we essentially have one kingdom that is suffering, it is starving, 
and it feels like the only way that it can survive is to attack other countries, steal their food, and bring it back to their people. Um, when they decide to launch a much larger attack than usual on another country, all of our characters get roped into one storyline. They're kind of all spread out, and then this big attack brings them all together. Oh, I don't want to tell you too much. I know that that's like a really vague storyline, but let me just say, there is like a thing that happens that I realized what was happening as it happened which is rare for me. Usually I can see, like, we see certain seeds being planted, right, for a future event. Basically, as I was reading it, I had this thought of, like, what if, and then literally on that page, my question is answered, and I'm just, like, jaw on the floor. She did, she caught me. She knew exactly when I would start to question things, and she was, like, there. And, I, oh. Oh, it was really good. There is romance. I'm always the one who's like, I could have gone for a little bit more yearning, but like, fine, totally fine with me. I enjoy how she writes her smuttier scenes. It's like almost closed door, but not. Like there's just enough. It was like very difficult to read. I think that she is someone who can write war and conflict with such nuance which I think is needed. It makes it like difficult as a reader. No, that's too close to spoilery, but she just did it, guys. She really did it. So this is your sign. If you loved Ember in the Ashes, start rereading it now so that you are ready in October to dive into air. And I can't wait. <laughs> anyway, now that my throat is completely gone, I would like to end the video here. I am currently, I'm almost done. I'm in the middle of filming a video in which I am reading all of Abby Jimenez's Part of Your World books. I'm doing a romance novel marathon. I'm losing my mind. Uh, that will be up soon for you, hopefully. And um, yeah, I just can't wait to talk about books. Oh, I guess I didn't even mention, I did read Crescent City <laughs> because I did the whole uh, plot summary video, but it was really bad. I read it because I was so interested in why no one was talking about it and people aren't talking about it because it's really bad. Like even big SJM fans are really disappointed. People are saying this is the worst book she's ever written. So if you are interested in knowing the story without financially supporting her or reading the book because really you shouldn't read the book. It was kind of a waste of my time. Uh, I made the plot summary for you. So yeah completely forgot again to mention that. And once again, you can use the code right here to get your first book of the month book for $9.99. Thank you so much as always to book of the month. Uh, you gave me a great read for this month, hopefully next month as well. So yeah, just once again, thank you as always to book of the month. All that information will be in the description box. I'm going to leave you here. I'm going to go drink some tea. I'm going to go read some Abby Jimenez <laughs> and I will see you guys next time. Okay. Thank you always.